If you would be opening your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And last week we left off right in the middle of verse 3. So we're going to pick up in verse 3 this evening. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. Mike, would you lead our prayer tonight, please? Our God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you give us in this life. Father, you have truly blessed us in so many ways. Father, we're especially thankful for your son that came to this earth to teach us the way that we should live, to die on the cross and Amen. As we mentioned at the beginning of our lesson last week, what we see as we get into chapter 12 is a retelling of the story or the vision that we saw beginning there in Revelation chapter 6. But what we're, what we're seeing is more detail. And we're not going to go through and rehash a lot of the things that we talked about in introducing this chapter. But with that in mind, we got down to verse 3. And in this verse, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. In this vision, and we noted the first part of this verse last week, but I want to go over that just briefly again so we get the full picture. Here we meet Satan. Satan is represented here as a great red dragon. Any time in the book of Revelation that we see the figure of a dragon, it is always indicative of Satan. And we see him positively identified as such, in the ninth verse of this chapter that we're studying, chapter 12. We also last week talked about a couple of the characteristics of this dragon that we see define certain characteristics of Satan. He's described as being great. And this term great in this verse is not being used in a positive sense to refer to something that is good, but it's being used in the sense of something that is powerful. And certainly we all would agree that Satan is very powerful in the things that he is able to accomplish. But another characteristic that we see of this dragon, notice the color. It's said that he is red. We've talked in the past about the fact that the color red generally indicates a, a, an evil person, one who is murderous, one that is bringing persecution and harm upon another person. And certainly we see that in Satan. We talked last week about the fact that one of the tools that Satan was using very effectively in those days was persecution because he knew that this was a strong temptation to the people. Any time that a person's physical well-being is at risk, this is something that is going to be a temptation to that person. If we can avoid that physical risk or that physical harm, then more than likely that's something that we're going to be tempted to do. Regardless of what the situation may be, we don't like to feel pain. 
We don't like the possibility of feeling pain. How many times have we known people that have avoided surgical procedures that they needed? Things that their doctors told them they needed that would make their life so much better, but they put it off because they didn't want to go through the pain. They didn't want to go through the negative aspects of that in order to get to the positives that lay ahead. Well, that's kind of what we see here. We see this reference to the negative. Yes, persecution was something that was alive and well. It was something that every Christian was facing in some way, shape, or form. But they were being encouraged that even if you do face persecution, even if you do go through these bad times, these hard times, that what lies in the future on the other side of that persecution is something that is far greater than anything that this world may have to offer. If you, Even if you have to lay down your life for your faith, that heaven awaits. A reward in heaven is there. And that's really where we left off last week. Notice the next part of this image. It says that he had seven heads and ten horns. Well, the number seven, as we've talked about many times, indicates uh, perfection or completeness. Well, in this instance, we see Satan being described as the complete embodiment of evil. There was nothing good in the person or the character of Satan. This great red dragon having seven heads indicates the fact that his power, his authority over the realm of this world was that which was complete. He had the authority and continues to have the authority to tempt the entire world. He's described oftentimes in the scriptures as the prince of this world or the ruler of this world, indicating that he has authority over those who are in this world. But I saw one commentator that described it this way. It says that this is indicating that he is an evil mastermind with complete power over the realm in which he operates. That's a powerful image, isn't it? He is an evil mastermind who is dedicated to nothing but trying to steal your soul from God. That's what's indicated in this image. But he's also pictured here with ten horns, indicating the authority or the power that he has. And obviously we know that Satan does not have complete unrestricted power. If he did, then we would not have the ability to turn away from Satan. We would not have the ability to overcome the temptations that Satan brings if his power was complete and unrestricted. We see a great example of this in the story of Job. You know, God allowed Satan to tempt Job in some pretty terrible ways. But that power was not complete in the fact that he could not carry it out to the logical end of actually taking Job's life. All he could do was tempt. And the things that he brought upon Job, certainly those were temptations to this faithful man. But he did not have the power to steal Job's soul away if Job was not willing to give it. And the same goes for us. If we do not want Satan to win our soul, then he can't. He cannot take it away from us. Now, he can tempt us. He can put things in front of us that would weaken us, that would cause us possibly to forfeit our soul due to sin. But the decision is ours. So in this, we see that he has complete power, complete free reign to operate in this world and to tempt the souls of man, but his power is limited in the fact that he cannot take the life and he cannot take away the free will of man. And we see this also when it says that he has seven 
crowns or seven diadems is a better translation. This concept of seven diadems. A diadem, at least in that day, in that culture, was a type of crown that was worn by a ruler of lesser authority. Caesar would have worn what they would consider the supreme crown. But those governors that ruled under Caesar's authority, whose impact and whose power was limited just to what Caesar had given to them, they would wear a crown as well, but it was not of the same splendor, it was not of the same value, and just by the image of that headwear that they would wear, it would indicate the degree of authority that that individual or that ruler would have. And so we see pictured here. In the book of Revelation, we see described two different kinds of crowns. The King James Version translates each of these simply as crown. But if we look at a more literal definition or a more literal translation, we could see that one should be translated crown and one would be better translated as diadem. Now, you may be wondering where I'm going at with this. There is only one figure, and let me, let me put it this way, there is only one type of figure that we see described in the book of Revelation as having worn a crown. And that would be those who are on the side of God. And that crown is described as a crown of life. It's described as a crown of victory. Because when it comes down to it, who is the supreme authority figure? It is God. Now, has God delegated certain degrees of authority or given certain rights to other individuals? Certainly. The Bible talks about the authority and the power that's given, say, to earthly rulers. That God is the one that gives them that right. God is the one that gives them that authority. Well, who gave Satan his power? God gave Satan his power. But Satan, his power is limited just to what God has granted him the right to do. And so we do not see Satan pictured here as wearing a crown of victory. We don't see Satan here pictured as wearing a crown of life like what is promised to Christians. He is wearing a crown or a diadem of lesser authority. And so whenever the Christians would see this, they would recognize from this that even though it was appearing that Satan was winning many battles, they saw many of their brethren being put to death. They saw their brethren uh, suffering tremendously. And to them, certainly it appeared that Satan was winning many battles. And while in their mindset, that was what was taking place. Satan was winning some battles, but Jesus was winning the war. The one that had supreme authority was going to maintain that position. Satan was going to operate simply in the way that he had the authority to do. And again, never once in the book of Revelation or anywhere else in the New Testament do we see Satan pictured as wearing a crown of victory. He's always pictured as one of lesser authority. And that authority has come from God. Okay, verse 4. And his tail... Continuing this image of the dragon, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So notice as this verse starts out, it talks about the tail of this dragon. And it says that he has drawn a third part of the stars of heaven to earth. Whenever we look at this, what is the only thing 
that Satan has ever really drawn out of heaven? Well, first off, he was cast from heaven because of rebellion. But he took a number of God's angels with him, did he not? Now looking at this, notice that it says a third of the stars of heaven. Well, sometimes we see this image of a star used in reference to the heavenly hosts, those that are there in heaven around the throne of God. Well, notice that it says that he drew a third of them. Well, this concept of drawing them means that he enticed them away. That he, going back to what we saw, was the evil mastermind that convinced them to rebel against God. He drew them away. And ultimately, they were cast out of heaven. And as we see in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 and also Jude in verse 6, it says that they were cast out of heaven, they were cast down, and they are now bound in chains of darkness reserved for judgment. Folks, their eternal destiny is sealed. They're not going to have an opportunity to change. Their fate is sealed. Now, we're not going to move much further in the text than this tonight. Because I think there is a lot that is presented in this verse and the next few verses that we really need to kind of flesh out and get a better understanding of what this is talking about because there is a lot of confusion in the world in regard to what we see pictured here. It is very possible that what we see being referred to here as the third of the stars of heaven being cast to earth. There are many Bible scholars who believe that this is in reference to the evil spirits that were active on earth during the time of Christ. The thing that we have to look at with this is we know that there was going to be a time when evil spirits would be present, would be active on this earth, but it was only going to be temporary. Because if we look at the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, it says that the evil spirits would pass from the land during the period of time that the Messiah walked on the earth. The evil spirits were going to depart during the lifetime on earth of Jesus. But also we see some of the statements that some of these evil spirits made to Jesus during that time that would indicate to us that this is the fact. That the evil spirits knew that their time was coming short. And so they were trying to wreak as much havoc as possible. In fact, in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29... We find evil spirits crying out to Jesus saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come to torment us before the time? So the question that they're being asked, or that Jesus is being asked, they're saying, We know that we're destined for torment. We know that we are destined for eternal destruction. Have you come to bring torment to us before it's time for us to go there? And so there is an area of thought, and I'll say from the outset, I personally do not see enough evidence in the scriptures to state that this is a definitive fact. But there, there's an area of thought that says that when Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven that they were cast to earth until the time that Jesus began his earthly ministry. And then during the lifetime of Jesus, and ultimately when he died on the cross, Satan and his angels were then restricted even more so in the power and the scope of their power. They were cast down, they were... Uh, bound in chains, in torment. The evil spirits were no longer able to go about this earth, but Satan himself still retains the power to tempt. Now, as I said, 
I personally cannot find enough evidence in Scripture to state that definitively. But what we do know is that there was a time when these rebellious angels were cast out of heaven, and as it says, were cast down to earth. They were on earth for a period of time. And ultimately, they were bound in chains. They were sent to torment where they are awaiting the day of judgment. Now, the exact timeline of that is something that we do not know. The exact number of these is something that we do not know. As you've heard me say many times, we do not take numbers in the book of Revelation literally. So I do not personally believe that what this is saying is that literally one-third of all the angels of heaven were enticed away by Satan. I don't think it's literally saying that. Because whenever we consider what the scriptures tell us about how many angels there are, think about how many that would be. Here's the way that we see it described in Revelation 5 and verse 11. It says that there were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Simply put, what John is saying is that there were so many angels there that the number was so high that it could not be counted. If we come into the book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 22, the writer of Hebrews describes it as an innumerable, so many that, that, that numbers cannot contain it, an innumerable company of angels. Now what this passage is telling us is that the number of angels that rebelled along with Satan was a significant number. A large amount. But I don't believe that we need to take this literal and say that this is saying that an exact one-third of the angels in heaven were led astray. But a large number were. But then we notice the next statement that's made in this verse. It says, And the dragon standeth before the woman that is about to be delivered, that when she is delivered he may devour her child. So Satan is now pictured standing there before this woman that we were introduced to back at the beginning of this chapter. She's feeling the pains of childbirth. She's about to give birth to a child, to a son. And Satan is standing there waiting for this to happen so that he can immediately do away with this child. Satan knew what was coming. He knew what Jesus was going to accomplish and he intended to waste no time in trying to destroy Christ. In fact, we find him using one of his agents, a man by the name of Herod the King or Herod the Great. He used Herod in an initial attempt to try to destroy Christ. When Herod made a decree that all children of a certain age were to be put to death. Well, we find that this became such a, such a possibility that Satan could overcome Mary and Joseph in this way. That Joseph was warned to take Mary, to take the child, and to flee to Egypt. Go to the place where they would be safe until this, this time of, of this unsettling situation had ended. And they fled to Egypt for a while, and there they were safe, they were secure, until finally they were able to return back to their homeland. But we also need to note that this was not the first time that Satan had tried to keep Jesus from coming into the world. We can go all the way back into the Old Testament and we see his use of the Egyptian army coming after the Israelites, after they had fled from Egypt, seeking to destroy the Israelites. If all of the Israelites had been destroyed, then the national lineage through which Christ was to come would have been destroyed. We also see the plot of Haman in Esther chapter 3 and verse 13, where he sought to put to death all of the Israelites. Once again, if he had been successful in that plot, then that lineage through which Jesus was to come would have been destroyed. 
But even during this period of time known as the intertestamental period, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, during this 400-year period, there was a ruler of the Greek Empire, a man by the name, and let me see if I can find it here in my notes because I can't pronounce it otherwise, Antiochus Epiphanes. He rose to power, and one of his main goals was to try to destroy the Jews. And so great persecution came upon the Jews at the hand of the Greeks. Well, if Antiochus had been successful in completely destroying that national lineage, then Jesus could not have come forth in the way that it was prophesied. But we see that in each of these instances, with Egypt, with Haman, with Antiochus Epiphanes, we see that they were all unsuccessful. Yes, they attempted to deal some very heavy blows. Antiochus especially had great success in in putting to death many of the Jews. But prophecy had to be fulfilled. God's plan was in the works. His son was going to come forth from that Jewish lineage. And so here we see Satan standing before this woman about to give birth, this woman is about to give birth to Christ, this woman is indicative of the nation of Israel. Through this nation, Jesus, this promised Messiah, was about to be born. But we see that this was not a one-time conflict. And that's something that we have to understand when we look at the book of Revelation. Much of what we see in this book is not talking about just one-time occurrences. We see that this battle between good and evil was something that had been raging ever since the beginning of time. Ever since Adam and Eve committed that first sin in the Garden of Eden, there has been a battle being waged between that which is good and that which is evil. And Satan has always stood opposite of God. God and Satan have never been allies with each other. You know, sometimes in the world today, we see those who are bitter enemies that for a while they can lay their differences aside in order to accomplish something for the common good. That's not something that's going to happen between God and Satan. God is the mastermind of righteousness and goodness. Satan is the mastermind of wickedness and evil. You're never going to see the two working together. You're never going to see the two allied with each other. Satan is always going to be in opposition to God. Coming down into verse 5, continuing this thought. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. In this very short verse, we see a picture of the entire life, ministry, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. We see the whole picture of Jesus presented in this one image. And there's really no need for John to elaborate any more in this case. Because these former Jews who were reading this... And these who had been followers of Christ, they would have known all of these details. And so there was no need for him to go into the life of Christ. Because this was information that they were already familiar with. Jesus came. He lived as a man. He died. He resurrected or was brought back to life on the third day. Then he ascended back and is now seated in heaven at the right hand of his Father. And with that in mind, he goes back now to talking about this woman. Well, what happened to her? Well, who did I just tell you that this woman is in reference to? You paying attention? Who is the woman in this image indicative of? Israel. Israel, The Jews. So let's look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, 
where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. There's that three and a half year period again that we've already seen. Well, after Jesus' ascension back to heaven, who became God's chosen nation shortly thereafter? Was it Israel? Come on, y'all. Who became God's chosen nation shortly after his ascension? We did. The church. It wasn't Israel any longer. It was those who were faithful to Jesus Christ. And that became the kingdom that Jesus was reigning over. Well, this spiritual kingdom that's also referred to as the church, it began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. We see all of this chronicled for us in Acts chapter 2. But in the early days of the church, we find it grew rapidly. During the first few years, it was growing by leaps and bounds. In fact, the text says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Would it not be wonderful if we could look at the community that we're in and say that people were being added to the body of Christ every day? You know, there's times that we, get, we may go months without hearing that someone was baptized into Christ. Or that one who had gone astray had been restored to the faith. But we think about the early days of the church. 3,000 souls on that first day. By the time the next chapter came around, the number of the faithful had grown to over 5,000. But it wasn't very long before, as we see in Acts chapter 8, a great period of persecution being brought about by the Jews started to come upon the church. And we read that the Christians, who were now this chosen nation, who now, and here's where we need to uh, realize how we need to rightly divide the periods of time that we're seeing here. Once Jesus died on the cross, once he rose from the dead, once he ascended to heaven, once he sent the Holy Spirit and the church came into establishment, this image of the woman is no longer indicative of Israel. One verse later on. We come into verse 6. Verse 5, it's still talking about Israel. Verse 6, it's now talking about the church. As this persecution came, much of it at the hand of, the, of a man named Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul. We find that in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 that these Christians were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then skipping down to verse 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now to understand what is being referred to by the description of a wilderness in this verse, we need to look at it through the eyes of the Christians in the first century. They were being driven from their homes. They were no longer able to live in their homeland. They were having to go out and seek new places to live. And so to them, it was as if they were dwelling in the wilderness. They were in a foreign place. But yet, God, through his providential care, made sure that they had places to go. And it's interesting to me that history has recorded that many of those Christians that fled the area in and around Jerusalem, that most of them actually found places where they were able to live in peace for a while before the persecution of the Romans finally came upon them. And so we see that they were scattered abroad. They were no longer able to do as much around Jerusalem as they once were because of persecution. 
But the places that they went to, these areas described and thought of in their mind as a wilderness place, a place foreign to them, they were still able to go there and preach the word of God. They were able to carry the gospel all over that part of the world. And so in this, we find that as they went into these places, they were being blessed by God. They were being spiritually nourished. They were being encouraged. And they allowed that to spill over upon those that they came into contact with. They preached the gospel, even though they weren't as comfortable as they would have been at home. Even though they were away from things familiar to them, they did not leave their faith behind. And as a result, the church continued to grow. Okay, we're going to stop there for tonight. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we stop? All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse 7 next Wednesday night.